imagine that the n bit string which is generated is say 0, 1, 0, and so on. And Bob knows some bits about it. So for example, he knows he has this index at i, so he knows that he knows the bit 1, bit 3, and bit 4, as an example. Now, obviously, we're going to use the encodings that we just talked about. And in fact, the quantum part of the protocol will be exactly that. So we're going to do this n times. And in each round, I'm going to flip a coin, and I will choose a bit at random. And I will also choose an encoding, either red or blue. So actually, Vadim, since you're sitting there, this is exactly what happens in the first step of quantum key distribution, only we'll do some different classical post-processing. Okay. So we do this many times, and in each step, we'll send it over to Bob. Now Bob is also going to flip a coin, and he's going to measure it either using the blue or the red box. Of course, he doesn't know which encoding we, we chose, so he just picks one at random. And they do this many, many times. And Bob is going to write down in each step what was his measurement outcome and also whether he chose the red or the blue measurement. So, like I said, there will be waiting times. Now we're going to wait maybe two milliseconds. And after this, Alice will in fact tell Bob which encodings she's chosen. So in this example, she'll send him blue, red, red, blue, and so on. Now, as we noticed before, if Bob measures uh, in the same color as Alice had chosen her encoding, then he'll retrieve this bit perfectly. So say if Alice measured, encoded a blue, and Bob happened to measure blue, he'll retrieve the bit. And otherwise, he'll get something random. So this means that, in fact, he knows some of the bits, namely the ones where, by accident, he chose the same encoding. And because Alice tells him the encodings, he can now write down which, which rounds he had, in fact, chosen the same encoding. And these are the bits that he knows. So out comes a string x1 up to xn. So this is the string that Alice generates herself here. And out comes some set. So this is like where Bob measured in the same color, say 1, 4, and 5. And Bob also writes down the bits from these rounds. So I mean, one important thing to emphasize here is that there is no storage needed for the honest parties. So you don't need any quantum storage, or in fact, no quantum computer to execute this protocol. So what happens? So we said that in the first step, we already want to be sure that Alice cannot learn which of the two bits Bob has received. But this is indeed quite intuitive, because note that communication only ever went from Alice to Bob and nothing ever went back in the other direction. So I guess it's intuitive that indeed there's no way for Alice to learn anything because she has not received any information from Bob. But what happens if Bob is dishonest? So in this case, we are exactly in the setting that we looked at earlier. So we sent many of these bits. And Bob has some kind of storage, so he may have a quantum computer do any encoding he wants, but he only has some number of noisy storage channel at his disposal. And note that the uncertainty relation tells us that if the rate here, if the, if the capacity here of this channel is too low, then in fact the probability that Bob guesses the entire string, so every single bit is correct, goes to zero when we have a very large number of bits. So this is how this assumption of storage together with the uncertainty relation comes in. The uncertainty relation tells us something about how much information we need to send through the storage. And then the capacity, the lim inherent limitations of the storage tell us that in fact the probability goes to zero. Okay. So maybe let's recall what we have achieved in the first step of the protocol. 
Alice has a string. Bob also has a string and he knows some of the bits. So the green bits are the ones that he knows. And then there's some red ones that, I don't know, he doesn't know, he measured in the wrong color. So let's go to step two. Namely, we'll subdivide this string into two parts. And our goal will be that Bob can know one of them, but he knows quite little about the other. So let me just recall, I guess it's clear, that if Bob cannot guess the entire string, then there will be some bits that he does not know. So there exist such bits. And there exists a primitive, I will only tell you exactly what it does, called interactive hashing, that does the following. So Bob inputs which are the bits that he knows. Say bit three, four, and five, and so on. This primitive will subdivide the string, the total string, into two parts. And it'll output two sets. So this is some sets of bits A, say one, four, five, and some set B, say two, three, six. So the crucial thing here, that it's possible to do this in such a way that the following two things are true. First of all, Alice does not know which of these two sets contains the bits that Bob knows. But Bob knows exactly which of the two sets contains the bit that he, Bob, he knows. And in fact, one of he will know all the bits in one of these two sets. But we can do this in such a way that in fact he knows only a few of the bits in the other set. So maybe to make a picture, what we do is the following. So we'll subdivide the string. So this is, say, the entire string. And say we'll pick these two guys to be in the first set and these two in the second set. So Alice has no idea. But Bob, say, in this case, knows all the bits in the first set. But in the second set here, there's, we have one that he doesn't know. But maybe he still knows something. So here he knows this one. And so the final step will be that he'll get rid of this something, namely by doing some kind of hashing. So I would like to emphasize that this is a, a different form of hashing that may, you may be used to than be using SHA-1 or all these things. Um, namely, it's called two universal hashing. And in fact, a very s inefficient, though simple way could be you could pick an, a function at random from a large number of bits to say a small number of bits as output. Okay. I don't really want to say how this works, but Alice is going to pick at random some hash function. She's going to tell Bob, this is the one that we're gonna use, and they hash it down, so it becomes much smaller. And uh, intuitively, this is what's gonna happen. So here we had the string. This is what we had after subdividing it. Now we're going to shrink it down, so into some smaller set A, something smaller b. And here we now have the property that if Bob knew all the bits, then he in fact also knows the outcome. But if there were some bits in there that he didn't know, then in fact he will know absolutely nothing about what comes out here. Now, you maybe see where this is headed, but yeah? Uh, so I have not explained the protocol. It's actually an interactive protocol. And they will together slowly decide how they will subdivide the string. Um, <laughs> but it's a classical protocol. There's nothing quantum going on. Uh, but we can talk about it later. OK. So before I want to conclude, let me remind you what we actually wanted to do. So we wanted to implement this funny primitive called one out of two Vliegis transfer. So Alice had these two inputs. And Bob wanted to know one of them. So maybe it's clear what we're going to do now. Namely, we're going to use the strings that we now painfully generated as a key to encrypt the information sent from Alice to Bob. So this is the key, say, that we could maybe use for S0, and this one we could maybe use for S1. So let's for